How are you all doing? A very, very beautiful more evening to you all. Hi, Sister Sheo, I see you. I see you all. How are you doing? Okay, first of all, um, while people are gathering on our channel, I'd like to address a few issues. You see, a lot of people believe that um, when you um, go against a, a doctrine in the church, you are misleading people. And I, and I don't agree with that. And here's my take. If you're following a lie, no one can lead you astray because you're already following a lie. And if there's anything I believe in and has always worked for me as an individual with or on my walk with Christ, is the truth and spirit philosophy once you have God's spirit he will give you his truth without his truth you cannot have his spirit I was <laughs> I was driven away from a whatsapp group today they called the whatsapp group a bible study group and I went there and I started sharing bible <laughs> with them they blocked me because the perspective well after a while i shared some they could not debate the things i shared so what they now went on to say was uh, okay i'm using one of the phones for the broadcast they now went and said the letter killet oh i educated them i said the letter killet is not talking about reading scripture he said god's kingdom is not a kingdom of words so where do you put matthew chapter 13 verse 12 those who listen to my teachings would have abundant understanding until they have an abundance of knowledge where do you put that how can ignorant people claim to be part of god's kingdom is that how it works that's not how it works for you to be part of god's kingdom you have to have knowledge because god himself said in hosea chapter 4 verse 6 my people perish for lack of knowledge so you can't just believe that there's a spirit that, that fills you up and, and ministers to you when you don't know the truth about God. As long as you keep believing things like Satan is Lucifer, you can't be on your way to salvation because that's not the truth. And the moment I started worshipping God in truth and in spirit, he started ministering so many things to me. He showed me everything. And what he has shown me, I have only shown you less than 1% or 2% of it. I'm not saying 10%, to 1%. You haven't seen anything yet. I probably have seen 10%. Out of the 10%, I've not shown you 1% of what I have seen and what still exists. So... When I teach and I'm raising, the, the free nation mantle is we're raising shepherds. I'm not raising sheep. We're raising shepherds. And as much as I believe, it is your right to know the truth about Christ. It is your right. That is why when um, that pastor came out and said, there's a curse upon anyone who criticizes a man of God. I said, show me in the scripture where the curse is. I, from last year even, we moved the free nation away from a church that criticizes. Of course, there's always going to be the whip in, in the temple, John chapter 2. You, you can't remove it out of scripture, no matter how hard you try. But you see, it was an instance. Matthew chapter 23 was an instance. Matthew chapter 23 was not the entire scriptures or the entire canon uh, it was an instance but we can't remove that instance and there's an instance where we need to take the whip to the money makers so whether you like it or not those things need to be addressed and we address them and when we were done we moved on to teaching about the truth in christ personally and for a very long time, for me to address a pastor, 
saying something it means that pastor has, that what that pastor has said is so off point that it actually needs addressing most of the time when i see that people are not going according to my understanding of scripture or my revelation because the scriptures also say um we prophesy in part okay maybe their understanding is from a different angle my understanding is from a different angle i teach my own sometimes i agree sometimes i come out and say okay this is a bit different this is a bit different can we all look at it through this here's the scripture i remember there was a time when i was very passionate and i will come up and i will strike out and that's not my philosophy anymore that time i couldn't teach because i was too busy fighting this person hey fighting that person hey fighting this person hey it was too much it was necessary at that point but we couldn't get the word out look at how much the free nation has taught in the last six months i have faced teaching the gospel finish this is the gospel according to the revelation that i have received and i have followed uh, god in spirit and in truth the scriptures say he is looking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth and i have worshiped him in spirit and in truth he comes first with the spirit or first with the truth it might vary but once he gives you the truth and you accept the truth he gives you his spirit. And when you accept his spirit, he gives you more. You can't contain God's spirit at once. He gives you a bit of his spirit and a lot more of his truth. So it's a spirit, truth, truth, spirit, spirit, truth journey. But without the truth, you perish. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. You perish without understanding. And if you read the New Living Translation, translation of Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, it says, you know, all the other Bibles use, uh, my people perish because they lack knowledge. The New Living Translation says, my people perish because they don't know me. So not knowing God is dangerous. And it is my perspective to teach you about God as much as is being revealed to me. One thing with me is, well, let me just expand on that. Since you guys have been following me, how many of you have ever paid me tithe? How many of you have ever given me offering? How many of you have ever sown seeds? Once in a while, somebody will give me a gift and I've never, from even from those days I used to fight with pastors, I never said gift was bad. And I'm also telling you today that your pastor has every right to be supported by you. It doesn't mean I'm being supported. Every once in a while, maybe three, four times a year, people remember me and send me something. But even if you supported your pastor weekly or uh, daily or however it is, there's scriptural allowance for that. So I'm never going to be against pastors and their ministries being supported and all that. I personally am against tithing. It is not a Christian doctrine. It was not part of what Christ handed over to the, to the apostles and disciples and what they handed over to the early church. It was not part of the doctrine. It was not introduced until 585 AD. I'm against first fruit. It is also not a Christian doctrine. It is out of Christianity. I do not support it and I would never preach that anyone should collect it. Now, some other people, on the other hand, might preach it and might... I would look away if a pastor preaches it and says, okay, we use the tithe to run off an age. I know it's not a Christian doctrine. I know it's even a dangerous doctrine. But I'll look away because it is your belief. Okay, that's what you want to do. Until somebody comes up and says, if you don't pay tithe, you will not make heaven. I have a problem with that. And I will defend that with my life. If somebody comes out and says, if you don't... So Listen, there are many instances. Imagine somebody who has been listening to Daddy Freeze teaches and then um, the guy is blessed and he's... Let me not go very far. Elon Musk. Elon Musk was worth 
as of this time last year, he was worth 24 billion. Today, he's worth 185 billion. What if Nicholas, um, I say Nicholas, um, what if Elon Musk, Nicholas Tesla, <laughs> he is another scientist from somewhere else because of the Tesla, I joined them together. Elon Musk, Elon Musk, I beg your pardon. What if he started listening to my teachings last year and then he got an extra hundred and something billion while he's at it and then he feels that ah these daddy freeze teachings really helped me to understand my perspective on spirituality and religion and all that and he goes to a ferrari shop the most expensive ferrari is probably at least production for about six hundred thousand dollars he has not even spent one million dollars of his 185 billion each billion is 1000 million he has not spent one in the 1000 of 185 and he decides to put it on a plane and send it to me as daddy freeze this is my love gift to you this is my talking to you there's nothing wrong with it and i've not seen who will tell me not to drive it so yes, if, if one gentleman decides to wake up one morning and buy um, Pastor Adeboy a private jet or whoever it is, you don't know the impact of that person on his life. And I will not go against it and say it is bad. It's, if he believes he needs it, it's all well and good. I personally do not think a pastor needs a private jet. But if he believes he needs it, I'm using that as an example. All right, all well and good. And I would not see anything wrong in somebody who is blessed by someone's teaching. Maybe the teaching helped you become more disciplined. Maybe it opened a channel to you. Maybe it didn't help you make more money, but it helped you find peace. There's someone called me the other day and said, Daddy Freeze, your teachings have helped me find peace. Maybe that person was just troubled in their spirit and you gave that person the gift of peace for one year and within that one year, the person was now able to make money or the person had access to some money or the person inherited some money or, or the person got into a business deal that was successful and the person decides that, you know what, this guy that helped me find peace, let me buy him something. And the person takes me to Banana Island and says, Daddy Freeze, this is your house you will now tell me not to live inside of course not i'll live inside and any pastor that lives inside i don't have any problem with that my problem is that monthly taxation system because it is unscriptural and it is unchristian there is nowhere in the scripture where anybody gave anybody monthly if you read the book of Leviticus and the books of Deuteronomy, you would understand that tithing was an annual thing and it was always crops and sheep, goats and cattle. It was never money. The only time when money was referenced was in Deuteronomy chapter 14, if you read from verse 22, where it says, if the place the Lord your God has chosen, and this is speaking of the celebration tithe, which is in fact, the holy tithe, because for you to pay that tithe, the Lord has to choose where his name is to be worshipped. The other tithe, the other tithes are the poor tithe and the Levite tithe. The Levite tithe is totally different. This, and it's not spiritual. It's just obeying a command from God. The celebration tithe is spiritual because God decides where his name is to be worshipped according to the old law. And he says that if the place the Lord has chosen is too far for you to carry 10 cows and 5 sheep, you can sell those things and put the money in a pouch or in your bag and take it there. And when you get there, you're not to give anyone. You're supposed to use it to buy wine, beer, drink, whatever it is, goat, sheep. And eat there with your family and celebrate in the presence of the Lord. So this salary tithing is unscriptural and it is unchristian. Same thing with first fruit. Giving the first and if you study the concept of first fruit, it was never taking your whole harvest. No, it was taking some significant amount of, from it and going to give at the altar and when you go to the altar you're supposed to say some things and the priest is supposed to respond it's not that you just do transfer from your account to it, it and it was the old law and a lot of people might not understand why i'm going on and on about this it's because what i'm going to teach today is going to rest heavily on these um principles 
Now, so we've understood it. If I see a pastor driving a Bentley tomorrow, before I used to have a problem with it, now I don't. Because I've also realized that somebody can't. Before I didn't think anybody go, oh no, they are all thieves. How you get a Bentley? My perspective changed. I've sat down with some pastors. I've picked their brains. I understand that okay, somebody can just decide to give you a gift. And let me tell you something. There's there's a part of scripture that we all miss. They say um, Judas took out. He was always helping himself from the money bag. Do I, do you want me to read this to you? I don't want to because it's not part of today's sermon, but I'm going to read it. So please forgive me because I didn't plan to use this scripture. It was, um, you know, when the woman washed Christ's hair in John chapter 12. So if you read from verse 1, six days before the Passover celebration began, Yahushua uh, arrived in Bethany, the house of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Yahushua's honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among uh, those who ate with him. Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed his feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with a fragrance. But Judas Iscariot decided, uh, oh sorry, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Then the scriptures in verse 6 are very clear to say, not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' monies, he often stole some for himself. What does that mean? Because there was somebody who had a conversation with me the other day and said, Daddy Freeze, there shouldn't be any money in the Free Nation account. I said, what if we have legal issues? What if you don't know, you are not with me when I meet people every day who need help and we, 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 we have a website to run? And the person was like, no, that as the money is coming in, you must be giving up. I now I said a question. I said, okay, where did Judas see the money he was stealing from regularly? There shouldn't have been any money. They wouldn't have needed any treasurer. If the, they didn't have an account, if they didn't have money that they always had, he would not be able to put his hand and pick it. If as the money was coming out, they were sharing it straight. Where would Judas see the opportunity to pick from the purse? So you need to understand these things. Yeah, they're difficult to preach uh, uh, and to understand, but they are the truths. For there to be a purse where Judas was stealing from, it means the disciples also had some money stacked away. So, churches need money to be run. I personally do not believe in 100,000 sit-up churches. I will tell you and I'll tell you again, they'll become nightclubs of the future. Those building them are building nightclubs. It happened in Europe, it will happen in Nigeria, and I'll remind you, just like I remind you of everything else. They are nightclubs. That's what they're going to end up being nightclubs big nightclubs but when you decide to come together and build a church even though i personally do not believe in physical churches i would not say having a physical church is a bad it's when it becomes hundred thousand that it becomes worrying because why do you really need a nightclub that big <laughs> if you ask me build a smaller nightclub <laughs> you know i build such a big nightclub because that's what it's going to be in 50 years but you see, if and there are also some places where you just have to have a physical church because online and other things are not really strong. And okay, yes. And when you have that physical church, you need to run it. So the church needs to be funded. The church needs support. I totally agree, 100%. But where do you draw the line in support? Me, personally. I draw the line. Someone says, so it's not good to have a big church. Well, it's good. You're investing into the future. You're building a big nightclub. It's awesome. People are going to be able to dance and social distance in the future, just in case there's a future pandemic. So, oh, yes, it's a great thing. But it's worthless to Christ.
Because if Christ didn't build a single church and neither did any of the disciples, they gathered wherever they gathered and the message was strong and powerful. Why do we need 100,000, 150,000, 50,000? Why do we need them? As far as I'm concerned, they're nightclubs. They're going to end up nightclubs. They're going to be discotheques. They're going to be, people are going to come out and boogie and party and uh, what was what's that dance? You put dance? Twist or twerk, yeah. They're going to come out and twerk. It's going to be a big twerk floor. That's what happens with religion, whether you like it or not. As long as religion remains exploitative and manipulative and a political tool, it's going to end up as a nightclub. So hate me all you want, but that's the truth. However, those who are not building nightclubs, those who are genuinely trying to reach out, help people, and they decide that they want to have a building and blah, 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 blah. That building needs support and there's nothing wrong in you supporting them. If you believe that they're teaching you something and you love their message, Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 clearly shows where Christ's ministry was supported. So, before we go into today's message, I'd like us to pray. What I said was just so that we all are on the same perspective. Someone said David built a church. I want to tell you today that David was not a Christian. What David practiced, if you practice half of it, you probably will not be walking today. The religion David practiced was a religion called Judaism. That is why I tell a lot of you that many of the Psalms and Proverbs have expired. They're not for this generation. They're not for this dispensation. They're not for Christians. David was not a Christian and can never be a Christian. And I'm also going to touch on David a little today. So you're right in the right place. You're going to learn something today. Okay? Even calling yourself David as a Christian, you are not answering a Christian name. <laughs> David is a Jewish name. <laughs> Ephedio is a Christian name. Paul is a Christian name. Saul is a Jewish name. But the problem I have with Saul and Paul is Saul became Paul politically. It's not when he gave his life or any of that thing that they taught you. No, those were all lies. Paul decided to answer Saul. Saul decided to answer Paul because he was taking the message to the Gentiles. And that's why the scriptures in Acts chapter 13 clearly tell us that Paul, also known as Saul, who was his other name? He didn't change the name when uh, uh, the Lord came upon mm -mm -mm -mm. Let's Let's leave the manipulation, the Romanization, and the politics out of the doctrine. What about Aaron? Of course, Aaron was not a Christian. Neither was Moses. Neither was Solomon. Christianity did not start until after the resurrection. Christianity, Judaism, in my opinion, ended in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 50. When the veil was torn from top to bottom and everything was exposed and he released his spirit. That is where Judaism ended. And Christianity did not begin until the resurrection. So anything before the resurrection was either full Judaism or Christ's teachings mixed with Judaism until when the resurrection happened. Now, you need to understand that there are three main factions in Christianity. There's the James faction, there's the Peter faction, and there's the Paul faction. The Paul faction was the most political, even though it did it gained the most ground and took the most, it worked the message more and took it to the world, but it was also the most political of all the factions. Peter in my opinion, was the most truthful, but he didn't do as much work and didn't have as much influence as Saul. That's Apostle Saul. James, on the other hand, was a strict believer of Judaism mixing, or some segments of Judaism like circumcision and all that, mixing with the teachings of Christ. James got it wrong to the large extent. Now, if there were three brothers who lived around the same time and they had three totally different messages it's you're sure that today there are going to be three different pastors who are going to preach three different messages so perspective is going to change but there are some things i personally do not bend on tight first fruit um seed sowing for money mammon all forms of mammon worship out of the church out I have zero tolerance for that. Secondly, I do not tolerate raising an ignorant flock. And they don't need to know it to confuse them. No, 
I must feed my flock with advanced formula, not just baby milk. I must raise them to the point where they can eat meat. And that is why I will tell you for free that in the free nation, we will, you will never hear us called Jesus. Jesus did not exist until 300 years ago or 400 years ago. We now know that his real name was either Yeshua or Yahushua. If I know the real name, why am I calling the one the Romans gave me and the our colonial masters who looked at me from head to toe and decided that the best thing they could do for me was put me on their plantation. Think about it. So I will not take their death. If I, know the, if I didn't know the real name, for instance, if we didn't know the real name and they say, okay, this is Jesus, I'll take it. But the moment I know that his name was never Jesus because Hebrew did not even have the J sound. English itself did not have the J sound until 1611. I will not take it. I will do what it needs because the scriptures say, at the sound of his name, all knees shall bow and every tongue will confess. What name were they confessing to and bowing to? It was not Jesus because it took another 1,500 years before Jesus came to the picture. That's why in the free nation, we take you to the original. We use Yahushua or Yeshua. We keep the Romanization out. Secondly, I cannot read Jerome's work in Latin the Biblia Vulgata, where he called Christ Lucifer. If you read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 in the original Latin language, as translated by Jerome from the Septuagint and the Coin Greek New Testament, the original word that was first used was the word phosphorus, meaning the bringer of light, phos light, phora to bring. It was translated into Latin by Jerome, and Jerome used a word that is 100% identical. The word is Lucifera, light bringer. And it was translated into English as the morning star, but the real 100% translation of Phosphorus is actually Lucifer. And that word Lucifer, you will find in the original Biblia Vulgata, or if you go online and search for the Latin Vulgate and type out 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, you will clearly see it there. Peter called Christ Lucifer, it's undeniable. The moment I know that, my own devil is no longer Lucifer. Because Christ said something about Peter and said something to Peter. He said, you, Cephas. What God showed you, no man showed you. And you are the rock, Petra, upon which I will build my church. So if Peter could call Christ Lucifer, then King James now calls Satan Lucifer by erroneously translating Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, which was originally talking about Nebuchadnezzar or some other Babylonian king. It wasn't talking about any heavenly being. Read Isaiah chapter 14 from beginning to the end in context. Don't listen to the people that will tell you... Um, uh, the letter kill it but the spirit gives life the letter they were talking about is not reading scripture it's not words it's the letter of the old law the letter of tithe the letter of first food the letter of uh, of the 613 laws of the old covenant read it you'd realize that King James made an error that's why I always tell you King James is the most erroneous of all scriptures the most heretic and the most dangerous to use if you base your understanding of scripture on King James you will worship demons finish so I can't see this and not teach it I'm gonna teach it to you and you cannot debate my stand because my stand is undebatable because it is unshaken in scripture in the perfect hierarchy of scripture it's not just reading scripture from here and there scripture has a hierarchy there's some parts of scripture that are more important i'll give you an example the direct teachings of christ are more important than psalms because john chapter 1 clearly tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was with god and now the word came down in human flesh and if you read verse 5 it, it, it says in the greek language it says phoston anderon the light of all mankind that was the word 
and Christ is this word. So if Christ is the living word, I will not take what David or Moses wrote over the living word. If there's any time there's conflict, I stick with the red scriptures. That is why in the free nation, we begin our doctrines in the red scriptures. Do you understand where I'm going with this? So I will have to teach you these things so you can be free. And once you listen to the knowledge, it's just simple. Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. The more you listen to my teachings, the more you'd have understanding until you have an abundance of knowledge. You must have an abundance of knowledge for you to be a Christian. Because Christ goes on to put the reverse and says, for those who are not listening, even the little they have will be taken from them. So if you're not listening to the teachings of Christ, if you're not absorbing the revelations as they're coming to me, and when a revelation comes to me, how do I check it's, from, it's not from the devil? I look at it through the hierarchy of scripture. I pray about it. I understand it thoroughly. And then I teach it. And when I teach it, those of you who are following me will absorb it and you immediately feel the presence of the Spirit of God. And once the Spirit of God comes into you, it will give you the yearning to have more knowledge, to fulfill what Christ said in Matthew chapter 13. So you must have that knowledge. You can't be a Christian and be ignorant. Anybody that told you that because they want you to be under some spiritual whatever it is, you're missing the point totally. And then now I'm going to today's teaching. I'm sorry it was 30 minutes of me going round in circles, but you know one thing about me, I like establishing things well. I don't have any issues with anyone. I love everyone out there. For the last one year, um, I have really respected what Pastor Adeboye has been doing. And you can go through all my teachings. I have given him awesome credit, especially with his response to this pandemic. He has shown maturity, even with his response to other things. So I don't have any problem with any pastor. But there are things I will not see. I will not see, what was this guy's name? Uh, Bushiri come on the pulpit and say God said. He went through January, February, March and said God showed him all those months. God did not show him COVID. God showed him all those months and said the year is going to be good. Not showing that he will be arrested. Go and read the book of Deuteronomy and see what happens to prophets like that according to the old law. And I will speak on instances like that. There was a video circulating about many prophets, Nigerians. They said, eh, they mean. I listened to the video. All the other prophets and pastors in that place were not prophesying in that particular video. They were praying for a good new, a, a year to be good. I can stand here and start praying, Father, let this year be the best year. Oh, I can declare and say this year is going to be the best year for everyone. I'm not prophesying. Declaration is different from prophecy. Your declaration doesn't mean it will come to pass. But when I come and I say, God showed me all the months and it was good that's no longer a declaration that's not saying something to into being that is lying and the scriptures are very clear they say a prophet who says what i did not tell him to say or speaks under the authority of another god the consequences are actually death i didn't say it the scriptures did so you've got to understand that now, moving to today's teaching, let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the beauty of your revelation upon this generation. I thank you for the direction. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your care. I thank you for your spirit in us. I thank you for your truth that mixes with the spirit to lead us away from ignorance and peril. And I ask, Heavenly Father, for more of your grace, more of your love, and more of your understanding. In Yahushua's name I pray. And all the good people in the house said a very big amen. Today I said I was going to talk about the other side, the other story. The Lila's other... The li the, 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 um, how did I say it? The Lila side of the story. Thank you very much, Amarachi. The Lila's side of the story. You see, for a very long time, we've taken exploitative biblical stories. We've cherry-picked them with lack of understanding. And we have 
as a result of this, consequently, built faiths and doctrines that are not just dangerous, they're mind-bending, manipulative, and political. That is why in the free nation we don't use Paul, we use Saul. Because the reason why he changed his name was political. So we're sticking to the original concept. We're taking politics. Anything, any Romanization, that as much of the Romanization that I can remove, I'll remove. So I can have a clear picture. Someone said, we need YouTube. But unfortunately, I don't have a phone to, to live stream YouTube. Even Facebook is suffering now. So what I do is I record and then I play back. It's very sad because I love the interaction from YouTube, but I don't have a phone and I'm not going to buy a phone because I realized that I work best with iPhones with high memory. So if I need a phone now, it's either going to be 11 Pro or 12 Pro. I do not have the money yet and I will not ask you for it. But the problem is, unfortunately, YouTube live streaming and Facebook live streaming will have to wait please bear with me the video will still be loaded at the end of the day but um you might just have to wait a little while so what we did was we cherry picked and the more i grow in the knowledge of the word of god people don't want to base their understanding of God on his word, they want to base it on a spirit your pastor is winding you up into believing. And in the beginning, was what? The spirit? No. What was in the beginning, John chapter 1? The word. A word is not a spirit. You don't spiritualize a word. You understand a word. A word is a spell. That is why witches use incantations. A word is a spell. You spell a word. The power of a word is in the hearing or the saying of it. And the greatest power is in the understanding of the word. That is why Christ said, the more you listen to my word, the more you have an understanding of the word until you have an abundance of knowledge. So I'll tell you, word is greatly important. Now, the more I listen to the word of God, the more I realize that God really wanted us to know about David and Solomon, not so we could be like them, so we could be, so we should be careful not to be like them. God doesn't want you to be like David. God doesn't want you to be like Moses or Aaron. God doesn't want you to be uh, like like Solomon. He wants you to read their stories and not be like them. Not You see, we were taught, we were, because it's beautiful, it's easy to sell a sinful David uh, as a, a man who was after God's heart. But you need to understand, under that covenant, there were people who God hated for no reason. Maybe not use the word hate, because hate is a strong word, but the scriptures are very clear. Jacob, he loved Esau, he didn't. Why? What did a baby in the womb do? And God is never wrong. That is why uh, I teach a lot of logic. Because at the end of the day, one of the first things we started a free nation with was, what's this guy's name? Um, Einstein's puzzle. You solve Einstein's puzzle. And at the end of the day, who has the fish for you to get that fish you have to be able to eliminate here you have to eliminate here you have to eliminate here with the information you have and then you'll be able to get to a conclusive answer so that is why as much as possible i will teach you along the paths of logic and knowledge then you base your spirituality on knowledge that's what i did and it works for me Someone said I should turn off the comments so everybody can pay attention. Guys, please pay attention. Don't comment unless you have to. I don't like turning off comments, but please don't comment unless you have to because I can see people are being distracted. So, you need to understand that God is never wrong. So, whatever he says, even if it is wrong, because it is God, it must be right because he's never wrong. But God still created darkness and light. 
I formed the light and I created the darkness. Go with me to the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I create the light and make the darkness. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. So when he says the darkness, does it mean that God is wrong? No. Whatever he does is right, whether it's wrong by your law, whether it's wrong by your code of conduct, whether it's wrong by your ideology, whether it's wrong by your understanding, it's your business because God is never wrong. So whatever God did in the new covenant, uh, sorry, in the old covenant was right. He wasn't partial, but he could decide to put his name through Jacob because he saw something at the end of the line that made Jacob more worthy for no reason. And he still wouldn't be wrong. But guess what? Somebody always suffered. Esau had to suffer for David, for um, Jacob. Adonijah had to suffer for Solomon. Adonijah was the right one in line of the throne. But David had promised Bathsheba. And then, because David is never right, because God also sees the end, through David, Adonijah was eliminated and Samson and Solomon, sorry, I beg your pardon, brought in. Same thing with Saul and same thing with David. What did Saul do? One day, God just realized that, look, God never realized. God always knew. But he wanted to use Saul to teach the Israelites a lesson. The moment they learned that lesson, he moved him out and brought David in. But you see, for David to, for Saul to move, for David to become the King David, Saul had to suffer for it, down to his next generation. That is why seven of his sons had to, they had to take their lives and put them on the uh, wall as sacrifices to end the famine. Same thing with Goliath. What was wrong with Goliath? The only thing that was wrong with Goliath was he was fighting on the wrong side. I'll say this. If Goliath was fighting for Israel, there's nothing he said or did that would have been wrong. Because in all honesty, look at Samson, look at David, look at all these people. They did a lot of wrong things, but because they were on the right side, they ended up being right. No matter what happened. And they ended up being praised and celebrated. And God doesn't want that. God put those stories in the scripture. Said scripture, all scripture is profitable to teach, to reproach, to rebuke. And to help you with understanding. Now, let me show you something. Go with me to the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. All praise to God the Father... Of our Lord Yahushua, who is the Christ, who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we, un we are united with Christ. Even before he made this world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us. This is a very clear scripture. We're not part of the story. The story was for the Israelites alone, everybody who went against them. If you read, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm, my prophets no harm. God was talking to kings. Uh, when the Israelites were passing through, they were not supposed to touch the anointed. The Israelites were the anointed. Today, no nation is God's anointed. Because God has adopted us all. It's, it's like me having a biological child and then adopting another child. The moment that adoption process comes through, the adopted child and my biological child have equal rights in my house. He goes on to say, God decided in advance to adopt us as his own family by bringing us to himself through Yahushua. This is, why, this is what he wanted to do. It gave him great pleasure. So when we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased 
our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He purchased us. The, the scripture uses the word purchase. What's the word purchase? When you hear the word purchase, what comes to mind? Amarachi, when you hear the word purchase, what comes to mind? Buying. We were bought. What does that mean? It means there were a there was a time that we didn't belong to him. He bought us. And if you read Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, So guard yourselves as God's people, feed and shepherd God's flock. His church purchased with his own blood. Once again, the word is used. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Purchased with his own blood. Who did God buy us from? Who did we belong to? Is a question that many people and many teachers will not answer. But I want to assure you. The word used. Periposiato. That's the Greek word. Bought us. Meaning. During the old covenant. We were the lost ones. For us to be part of the new covenant, God had to buy us. And he didn't buy us with money. The scriptures are also very clear. Go with me to the scriptures. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose value. You were ransomed but with the precious blood of Christ. Now before Christ came you were not ransomed. You were not purchased. You were Gentiles. And what applied to David, what God did with the Israelites, what God did with David and Solomon and all these people was to teach us and pave way in historical, in our history for us. You need to understand that what Delilah did, how different was it from what Rahab did? Rahab protected us. Delilah protected her people. Who would Delilah have stood for? Really, would you expect Delilah to commit treason against her people? God's plan was to go through Rahab. Not Delilah. But in the new covenant, both Rahab, Samson, Delilah, Goliath, David, all of them have the equal love of God. God ransomed them all. If they were all still alive today, both David and Goliath would have been ransomed. All they needed to do was testify like the apostles did in Acts chapter 4, if you read from verse 32. And when we look and vilify Delilah, we miss out on Samson's own story. Under our new covenant, Samson is the one that is going to suffer, not Delilah. Have you ever bothered to read about Samson? Let me show, let me open up some scriptures for you. Let's study about Samson. If you read Judges chapter 14. From verse 1. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. 
When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and his mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among the Israelites you could marry? They asked. Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. His father and mother didn't realize that the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at that time. God was doing something through Samson. The Philistines were, were uncircumcised Gentiles. The Israelites were God's people. Not today. Today, Philistine, Israelite, all have been ransomed with the blood. And if you continue reading the story, it, it throws more light into this. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyard of Timia. At that moment, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. But he didn't tell his father or mother about it. When Samson arrived in Timnah, he asked the woman... He talked with the woman and was very pleased with her. Later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, he turned off the path to look at the carcass of the lion and he found a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. He scooped some of the honey to his hands and ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother and they ate it, but he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. As his father was making final arrangements for the marriage, Samson threw a party at Timnah, as was the custom for the elite young man. When the bride's parents saw him, they selected 30 young men from the town to be his companions. Samson said to them, let me tell you a riddle. If you solve my riddle during those seven days of the celebration, I will give you 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. But if you cannot solve it, you must give me 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. All right, they agreed. Let's hear your riddle. So he told them the riddle about the honey. Now, so Samson's wife came to him in tears saying, you don't love me. You hate me. You have given my people a riddle, but you don't, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't given the answer to my father or mother, he replied. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. And then she explained the riddle to the young man. So before sunset of the seventh day, the young man came to town to Samson with their answer. Samson replied, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved the riddle. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon them, upon him, and he went down to the town of Ascalon and killed 30 men, took their belongings and gave their clothing to the men who solved the riddle. But Samson was furious about what had happened, and he went back home to live with his father and mother, so his wife was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. So first of all, Samson had a weakness for women from the beginning. This is his first wife. He had a weakness for women. He told her his secret. Why do you think they went to meet Delilah? Because they knew that there was a woman he was with before who badgered him enough with her love and he told the story and he told his secret. Now, if we move a little further, Samson had a weakness for women, meaning Samson was easily manipulated by a woman he loved. But it didn't just end there. Samson also had a physical lust for women. If you go with me Still in the book of Judges, sorry, hold on a second, my internet, someone said, never knew that Samson was married before Delilah. He wasn't married. 
He was about to be married, but they gave the woman out to someone else. Now, you need to understand that nagging started before Delilah, not from Delilah, before Delilah. Now, there's another point that a lot of preachers and teachers miss out that they never tell you. If you go to um, uh, still in the book of Judges, I think it's verse 16. Let's go to Judges. Judges chapter 16, let's read from verse 1. One day, Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. Oh yes, it's right there in the scriptures. So Samson, first of all, had a weakness. He was one of those men that women, if they cry and cry and cry and manipulate, he'll be able to, they'll be able to wind him and get whatever they want from him. Secondly, someone said, how did nagging start before Delilah? Was his wife not nagging him? The woman that he had a wedding celebration for? Delilah is still far. We are talking of before Delilah. Then, then in Judges chapter 16, Samson went to a Philistine town and spent the night with a prostitute. Someone said, why can't we name our kids Delilah, but we can name Samson? I don't get it. Yes, Samson did what he eventually did for the glory of God and God put him there, but his life was not a model life. Read it. Delilah did what she did for money. Samson for lust. Lust and money are both dangerous. And I cannot say lust is, more, is better than money. Samson was driven by lust. Delilah was driven by money. So if you can name your child Delilah, Samson, I don't see why you can't name your child Delilah. So if you read this, one day Samson went to, that's Judges chapter 16 verse 1. One day Samson went to, did you know that Samson used to patronize prostitutes? Did you know? Have you ever heard of that before? Have you ever read this in any scripture before? Has any teacher ever sat down to explain this part of Samson's life to you? So word soon spread that Samson was there. So the men of Gaza gathered together and waited at night at the town gates. They kept themselves quiet during the night, saying to themselves, When the light is of morning, we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, lifted them up bar and all, and he put them on his shoulders and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across Hebron. Just to show them his strength. Then, some time later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah. So the prostitute incident, the uh, first wife incident, all happened before the Lila, who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, Samson was in love with the Lila. Was Delilah in love with Samson? I'm not saying that selling out on somebody who loves you is a good idea. But obviously this love was one-sided. It came from Samson. It was not reciprocated. Delilah, of course, might have been thrilled with him. Oh, he's so powerful. He's so strong. And, but there's, it's clear that Samson loved Delilah more than Delilah loved Samson. Then the whole story of how they went through all of it to get to where they got to and eventually what happened. And of course, Samson also had a sad end. He lost both his eyes um, and he was in prison. And then at the end of the day, he ended up uh, bringing down the, the, 
the building where he was and a lot of lives were lost and blah 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 nobody does that in the new covenant all these happened for a reason and I want you to go with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong we use scripture to teach us what is half true but we never realize what is wrong basing your life after Samson or David is wrong you need to see that these people were not role models It cor in our lives and it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Many of us miss the essence of, of the scripture. And I want to ask you today, if Delilah were a Christian and Samson were a Christian, Delilah too would have had a side of her own story. She would have come out and told you, this guy loved me, probably. I didn't really send him. I knew he liked women. I knew he was into prostitutes. I didn't take him seriously. But he was a cool guy. I'm not saying what Delilah did was right, but I'm just coming from her perspective. So, in order not to have a woman like Delilah, you must make sure you are not a man like Samson. Because as long as you are a man like Samson, you will get Delilahs in your life. Someone said, but Delilah is the cause of Samson was down. That's what they told you. And that's what applied in the old covenant. In the new covenant? No. Say Samson in Judges chapter 16 that went to spend the night with prostitutes. Or Samson that went to... Ma and if you, read, if you read Judges 14, there's something I wanted to show you that, that, that is very important for your understanding of scripture. If you read Judges 14, let me quickly go there. Just hang on a second, guys. Yeah, Samson, um, Judges chapter 14. Uh, verse 1, a young woman, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught his eye then i i want to show you okay when he, he s didn't realize okay samson's parents were going at the moment um he said why must you marry uh another woman isn't there any other woman from among your tribe what did that mean isn't there any woman among your tribe? And and I want to take you somewhere with this. First of all, you need to understand that the three women that were mentioned in Samson's life was were all Gentiles. now when they were going to in judges 14 when they were going to so, sorry hold on a second there's something i'm looking for when they were going to uh to the place that is timna uh, near the vineyards of timna if you read some other extra um books it says that his parents were worried that why would you want to go and marry from these people who mixed you know according to leviticus chapter 19 verse 19 you're not allowed to mix two crops together but you know the way the pagans used to they just used to mix anything and mate all kinds of animals 
and it was against the teachings uh, of Leviticus chapter 19 verse 19 I'm not going to read that for you because I've run out of time I'm trying to round off very quickly you know and if you read that you'd realize that there was a clear distinction between the Philistines and the Jews the Philistines were all not subjected to God's law or the old Mosaic law but the Jews were and, and the reason why Samson's parents didn't want him to get married to the Philistine girl was because he f they felt that the way they mix their animals and they mix their crops that's the same way their girls are their girls are a reflection of their vineyards so today that divide that separation no longer has value because they're no longer Jews or Gentiles go with me very quickly to Galatians chapter 3 very quickly Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 for you are all children of God through your faith in Christ and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ. Now, at that time, there was Jew and there was Gentile. If you read the story uh, of Samson and Goliath, Goliath was the uncircumcised Gentile. Once again, the Philistine. Now, what we have done in God's new covenant is to take over, to cherry pick some bad things from the old covenant and still declare the Philistines as our enemies. Meanwhile, that was the old covenant. The Philistines are covered with God's love and grace, just like the Nigerians, the Americans, the British, the French, everybody is under God's grace. And that's why if you read uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 10, Apostle Saul was very careful when he said, those of you who believe that they're going to be vindicated by the law are under a curse because the law says, cursed is anyone who does not obey every single thing written in the book of the law and everything includes you cannot eat catfish you cannot eat shrimp you as a man you cannot you're not allowed to trim the hair on the sides of your face or your beard so you can't pick one and not do the other simply because it fits you right now god abolished everything and you can clearly see sorry light went we'll continue with the teaching you can clearly see this in acts chapter 10 the lesson in Acts chapter 10 was not for Cornelius it was a lesson for Peter the teaching of Acts chapter 10 was more so for Peter than it was for Cornelius because Peter when he saw the sheets coming from um, heaven he disagreed with God and said he will never maybe we should actually eat it maybe we should actually sorry I said eat it maybe we should actually read um, Acts chapter 10. So we can understand this. In the free nation, if there's anything you've noticed, I never throw script. I don't just say Acts chapter 10. I read it for you so you can understand in context uh, what it is. Those of you who said you can't see me, don't worry. I live in a 24-hour uh, electricity estate. It will come out in it will come back in one minute or two. So, if you read Acts chapter 10, um, verse 10, or verse 9 in context. The next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry, but while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up Peter, kill and eat them. No Lord, 
Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. Now, if you go further, because I'm not going to read all this, you can spend your time reading it. Um, if you go to verse 28, Peter told them, you know, it's against our law for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I could no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. So even from the time of Acts, there was no longer an unclean Philistine or an unclean um, Roman or an unclean Gentile, Paul himself said, God shows no partiality. So if all of a sudden we're now unclean, we're now all clean because of the grace through which we were purchased using the blood of the Lamb, why would we sit here and cast aspersions on Delilah, who unfortunately lived under a time when her people were considered outcasts? and unclean are we fit to judge someone who didn't live during a time when the blood of christ was paid for the ransom of her sins whatever she did good or bad it was all bad because she was unclean goliath was unclean and we look at that and we think that Christianity makes you special and makes you cleaner than any other person or any other um, uh, faith. And I tell you the truth. It doesn't work like that. Many Christians do not obey Christ. They just call themselves Christians. They name themselves Christians. They're nominal Christians. They identify with Christianity, but they're not Christians. Because the first thing you would know in Christianity is that if Delilah had the grace of our covenant, she could still have been saved. If Goliath had the grace of our covenant, if Saul, the king before David, had the grace of our covenant, he would have been saved. But they lived at a time when they were not purchased. They were not ransomed. And we judge them unfairly. Because we have an opportunity no other human on earth had, except for the Jews, before Christ resurrected. And the scriptures are very clear. For God so loved the world, not the Jews, not the Israelis, uh, not a specific tribe or nation, the world. He gave his own begotten son. He ransomed with his blood. And many of you take this for granted. Many of you jump into the old covenant and hog Samson, who was in no way character-wise better than Delilah. scripture is there for you to understand and the scripture is there for you to go on your knees right now because do you know what if christ didn't die and resurrect you would have been a delilah you would not have been a jew and <laughs> today they, they, they're born you for israel you would have been a goliath you would have been an unclean person And what ransomed you was not the law of tithing or first fruit or seed sowing. The law was never meant for people like Delilah. That is why Delilah's family disobeyed Leviticus 19 verse 19. Because the law was never meant for them. So how do you who have the gift of, the, of grace judge someone who even the law was not meant for? At least Samson had the law. The Philistines did not even have the law and they did not have grace. 
and then you sit down here given the power of grace upgraded from even an Israelite who had the law and then you judge those who didn't have it I think it's wicked and unfair many of you are 10 times worse than Delilah and 70 times worse than Samson but you call yourselves Christians in ignorance I want to pray with you today father let me not take for granted the purchase the buying out of my spirit the redemption of my soul father let me not take it for granted there were people who didn't have the opportunity I have today And I have judged them in error. Putting myself on a higher pedestal. Meanwhile, it was the ransom that you paid. A sacrifice that you made. That put me on the sheet. That was put before Peter and declared clean. It was not by my effort or my power. Father, give me the grace never to take this for granted. Give me the grace never to judge anyone. The scriptures are clear. We are not to judge outsiders, but those who are in the church who are sinning, we are to judge. Instead, we judge outsiders. We judge Delilah. According to, to, to the new covenant, we have no right to judge Delilah. But we have to, the right to judge anyone inside the church who's sinning. Father, let us be able to recognize the difference. Let us be able to recognize the truth. And I beg for your mercy. I beg for your spirit. I beg for your truth upon us. I beg for liberation and freedom. In Yahushua's name I pray. And all the good people in the house said a very big amen. Thank you, everyone. You've been ransomed. You've been purchased. You're clean. You're free. God bless you.